And is everyone seeing my is everyone seeing my slides? No. No? Okay. Um let me do it this way. Are you seeing it now? Seeing it now. Yes. Yes. Okay. Good, good, good. Um Okay, where am I? Come on, view. Why am I not getting this thing? My computer updated last night. I don't understand why they do these things to me and you have to search. Everything is moved to another side or under another column. Okay. Well, let me go ahead and get started here. Uh, okay. So we want to welcome everyone to Environmental Fridays. It is personal. This is season four of Environmental Fridays. And um, you can learn more about Environmental Fridays at our website, uh, which is www.theenvironmentalfridays.com. Um, coming up here in the month of April, because this is our last Environmental Fridays for the month of March. The month of April, we have at least four presentations. First will be a team of three persons that will talk to us about personal consumer and beauty products and the connection to breast cancer. Then we will hear from a secondary school teacher in Trinidad and Tobago, um, incorporating environmental science into the high school curriculum. Then we'll go to New Mexico, another, another suggestion from Laurel, another connection <laughs> from Laurel. Um, Prestine would tell us about what's happening in Red Lake um, in the sawmill cleanup. And then um, the final episode for April would be Susan Buchanan. And I think Laurel also connected me with her. Um, Priscilla <laughs> Tobias I knew on my own. <laughs> um, and they will tell us about a campaign and an organization called A is for Asthma that actually is a direct result of Environmental Friday. So that's what we have coming up here in the month of April. Um, our co-host today is Sonia Gupta. She is a graduate student uh, in religion, regional studies at Harvard University. She did her, uh, her master's, uh, her bachelor's, sorry, um, at the University of Illinois in Chicago, where she studied biological sciences and Russian studies and did a minor in sociology. She has a wide interest in things and in knowledge. Her research that she's interested in and focusing on includes improving health infrastructures, identifying medical deserts, understanding the fundamental causes of disease to create better public health initiatives. And her goal career-wise is to be a physician who improves health equity and pursues interdisciplinary research to combat public health issues. She, she is a very impressive young lady and it's a privilege to have her here with us today. So Sonia, it's your time to um, introduce our speaker for today. Thank you so much, Jasmine, for the kind introduction and warm welcome. Um, good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure today to be able to co-host this episode of Season 4, Episode 11 of Environmental Fridays. And today we'll be hearing from Mrs. Lydia Vanessa Frazier. Mrs. Lydia Vanessa Frazier has been a professional educator for over 34 years now. She has provided trainings, workshops, and presentations in the Missouri Boothell State and Federal Agencies on capacity building in urban communities, environmental job training, environmental health, and land reuse. Her training and education provided her with top-shot skills to be used during COVID-19 
and she has a vast knowledge, preparation, and practice in environmental training, design, and delivering effective training. Past trainings include the National Environmental Safety and Health Training Association, the U.S. Department of Transportation Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration, 16 and 40 hour course on DOT hazmat regulations and instructional design, which includes certification in DOT HM 181 and 215 and HM 126F hazardous materials training program. So Vanessa, thank you so much for agreeing to be part of Environmental Fridays. And now I hand it over to you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, the website is being, is being redesigned, but you can still see uh, some of the information is just still. So um, I'll go ahead and share my slides. Okay. Um, okay, I'm getting a freeze. Let's try it again. Oh, it's not that one. There we go. Okay, you go. Very can good. You see it? We could see it. Awesome. Okay, this is just the beginning and of our community of Howardville is in, located in the Boot Hill of Missouri. So I share a couple of partial maps so you can kind of get an idea exactly where we're located. And what's called the Boot Hill, if you would picture the state as a then the, the part that's going here that's jutting down is the heel of the boot. So it's called the Boot Hill of Missouri. And the picture beneath it is give you a more clearer picture of where New County is located the lime green, and Howardville is right beneath that, as well as Pemiscot County. We have two communities in that county that we are working with on this grant that we received last year, and that's Homestown and Hayta Heights. Pemiscot County is the highest county in the state with the worst health indicators, and the outcomes continue to be 115 per county. And we only have 115 counties, so Pemiscot County is always at the bottom. So the health needs in all corners is, is dark. And so this presentation, I believe, is not the one that I'm sure that I wanted. But this is opportunities for, for betterment. You can kind of gloss through the information that's on the side of the slides, and there's a picture of Howardville, um, right here. Can you see the the uh, the arrow? Yes, yes. Okay, that, that yeah. is the Howardville School. It was located on 16 acres, but over the years they put in a subdivision, and these are the houses. So you can just walk right out of someone's house right into the school, which had asbestos and lead-based paint. So there was a lot of damage that occurred in the building when the school was closed. And so the city had to seek an environmental uh, cleanup grant to remediate the asbestos-based paint. And that is the picture of our school. And just to give you some um, quick information as I roll these slides through, it was listed to the National Historic Register on our very first try. The state advised us to not get discouraged because you don't usually get listed on the first time. It usually takes two or three times to nominate it. And so the information was sent in on August the 5th and it was nominated November 22nd, um, 2017. It was listed to the historic register. Most of the time when you travel through Missouri, this this right here is Highway 61. This was the only corridor from north and south all the way from Minnesota to the Gulf of Mexico before they put in Interstate I-55. But we're still only located uh, half a mile from the interstate. 
this picture here is of community engagement. What we did was had to have, when we got the cleanup grant, we had to have charrettes, community visioning, and photo language. And so you got just pieces of what it is in order to try to get you as much information as we can. What this young lady is doing right here, she's our president, and then Daniel. And what we did was they split the groups up and you don't see them because I think this is the wrong presentation. Yes, it is. This is the wrong presentation, but I'll work with that. We'll go back. Okay. There were groups split up. We had senior groups. We had the teens and the, the youth that you see here. They were doing the photo language outside the following day. But each of us, there were five groups uh, in, the, in this session, and they had to write down everything that they thought the community needed. And so this is community engagement. You want to involve everybody in the community, even the people that don't like you. There's somebody that like you, you have mutual friends, give the information to them, let them share it. And when EPA come into the community to have a meeting, they'll know that you didn't get in contact with everybody because the hell raisers are not there. They don't like you. If they're at that meeting, they're gonna try and cause problems for you, but they don't realize that EPA find joy in that because you did reach out to everyone. So things are not always as they seem, but this is why we participated and we got all of the youth together. We was given three dots after we put all our signs up and we had to mark, put the three dots by the most priorities of need. And so this is what we ended up with, the 10 choices, which is scratched out. But number one was job training. And we were mystified about that because we've always said we need a community health center that will house a federally qualified community health center. We are medical wise. We don't have any minority occupations here in positions. There, there may come one or two, but they will leave. And this is in the five county area of the boot hill. There are hard, hard issues and choices that have to be made because of misdiagnosis, inattentive to care, uh, not concerned, uh, giving medication that's not doing what it's supposed to do but causing other ailments. So we thought we have to take care of ourselves and um, just use aspirin or whatever we need to till we can get a, a job training uh, center of what they're needing there to fix the building but we wanted to be designed as a, the, the best mega center of help that can be delivered to this boot hill. But you see number seven, this is, was our priority. And I had to justify that. Well, Vanessa, you're saying you need a fairly qualified health center, but the number one come out to be job training. How do you compose that, that this could happen? And everybody know that you need it. And living in the boot hill, I had to look at all the choices that was made between one and seven. And I said, well, job training, if they can get a good job, you can immediately alleviate some of the stressors because poor health come from inability to pay bills, inability to provide food, nourishing food for your family and to meet other obligations. So Cancer, heart disease, stress, all of those things, stress is related to all of those issues of health. So this conference center, if you have a good job, you can knock off immediately a lot of those elements that you're enduring. A conference center is something you can bring into entertainment. When you get have joy, you feel better. And the computer media center, you see on the activity center, the youth and seniors want their own. And they want what's specific to their own needs. These are activities, events, things that you can do to uh, increase exercise and the severe weather shelter. We are in under uh, a series of tornado outbursts this evening and tonight. And these rural communities here in the Boot Hill do not have a shelter. 
they don't have them in their home. We have a high water table here, so there cannot be any basements added to your homes. And so it's a frightening situation when it comes time for a storm. And with climate change, we're getting ifs, uh, fours and fives, like what occurred in Mississippi. I could see that happening in the boot hill because our thought is substandard. And so a lot of the funding that come through is somehow it is redirected. And so you have to de rely on your community and each other to try to do the best you can. And so the other one's the restaurant. Of course, we want, there is a cafeteria in the school and we want someone to make nourishing food for sale. And we want to grow our own community gardens and, and have their produce sent there. There is a, not only a, a medically underserved area, there is a food shortage area. There is no nutritional produce that is sent to our region. It's produce, but it's full of pesticides. And sometimes you have to travel 60 miles to get nourishing uh, produce for your community. And so this bottom picture here is the, uh, as I mentioned, the, this picture and this picture are the outside. Uh, we did the photo language in the park. The young people here, they are very respectful. And I wanted them to speak open and honestly. And so I told our team that I want to split these groups up. I want the youth to be first at nine o'clock Saturday morning and the adults will come after them. And once they see that no adults are around, they're still gonna be respectful, but they're gonna speak their heart. And so they did do that. And these slides are not the slides that we did, that we needed. I'm sorry. This was a tire roundup that we did in front of the school. We was needing information from the rest of the county on what they would like to see in this school once it's redevelopment. Again, it's not only community engagement, it's county engagement. And so men, are the biggest spender of tires. And we held these events on June, uh, Father's Day weekend. And so what I asked them to do was to go around throughout their community and pick up tires that's been thrown out. We want to not just clean up our community, we want to clean up the county. And so they came from all 15 communities with tires. And Believe it or not, as they were picking up these tires, I had a broad idea. Well, our park still needs work. So I asked them to pick all the good tractor tires that was available and don't put them on the truck, set them to the side. So these people here are my stream team association people. This person here was the state coordinator, Mark Van Pat, And that's me. And the rest of these guys with the stream team, t-shirts on. We get a new one every year. So you have to hurry up and get a project done or you're going to miss that color. These other gentlemen are the New Magic County roadside crew. They bought all of their information over and all of their equipment and loaded those tires on these trucks. We did four, four trucks. We have a contract with Bridgestone. It's a partnership actually, Bridgestone Tires. They'll drop a trailer and they'll come back and pick it up and they take it off and shred it and use it for the matting on playground equipment. But we held those tires back. They bought them and delivered them to the park. And you can see where the youth sprayed them. And so they do what they're supposed to. We do our part and they do their part. But this particular slide was something that, let me go back. So Vanessa? Yes. Vanessa, so I have, I remember I have your slides that you, you know, your presentation you sent me last night. This is the wrong one. Could you so, pull that up? So I could pull it up and show it. And you could. It would be a little. Yes, I'm having to skip around. This okay. Was another so let me, okay, let me do that for you. Okay, thank you.
So this is the one you sent me. Vanessa? I need to stop sharing, okay. I Yeah, are you seeing this one? Yes. Okay. This one. So, so where do you want me, want me to begin for you? Yes, there you go. It's just a basic analogy of where the blue heel is. Okay, next slide. Okay. It's a brief history of just basically how we got moving and how we got started. The, we received an environmental justice small grant uh, just to address specific health issues. We, we worked with the youth, uh, two juniors and three seniors to have a little part-time money to help with their uh, senior activities. And, and what we designed, the survey that the community citizens completed ended up in a home in a community assessment. And so I want to quickly share those results. Next slide. Now, this is just some history went went on back and then when the community was first founded. It was a total of 2,000 acres. Travis B. Howard was the founder. He was an educational scholar, principal, superintendent. He had one son, um, Elson Howard, who's the first Black New York Yankee. You guys can look him up. We have him, all of his information. We intend to put the museum in the school and feature him and his dad. His dream was to build a school and develop a thriving new community for poor Black sharecroppers and tenant farmers who had nowhere else to go after the mechanization of farming in 1939. Actually, that was um, a nice uh Jester because they threw the people off the property because they would no longer give them their subsidy checks that the federal government sent to them. So they lived and camped on Highway 61. And that's when the federal government came in and built these 10 communities called demo housing. And so they were built with the best quality at that time. But a lot of the communities, at least three or four, are basically nothing but sheds. Mr. Howard was our first mayor. And the things that took place under him because the community was just dirt. There were no street lights, city streets, sewer, or running water. This occurred under the next mayor. And this housing addition that you saw connected to the school occurred under the next mayor. And the current mayor is still the mayor. <laughs> uh, under his administration, he resurfaced our streets, park renovations. We did eradication of overgrown vegetation. And we start to have annual return to Howard Bill events. And in 2013 is when we got the cleanup grant for the school. And you'll see why that came about. Next slide. How be a community better? This is our community betterment. And this is the order in which we came about. The citizens formed a beautification committee in 1975 and the women pretty much ran it trees, we planted flowers. It was all about beautification. And I moved away when I graduated and come returned back and the community was just devastated worse than what it was. And I, and so I worked at a law firm. So I went ahead and, and got the, the community betterment incorporated with the state. And then the next year we got our 501c3. And so we received the grant um, from the US EPA in 1998-2001. It was for a child health champion. We were the pilot for Region 7. And before this grant was over and after it was over, our, our project was the model for the nation. So we thought we can do pretty good at that. We can do more. So we entered the Missouri Community Bedman competition each year, and we didn't win anything. Next slide, please. We didn't win anything, but we didn't give up. This grant that we received in 2005 of what I was mentioning about the youth that we employed part-time three days a week was to address safe drinking water, indoor, outdoor air, of course, asthma, and sewage gas. You can That comes up through your drains in the summertime um, and solid waste. And more in de definitive in the community, these are the things that we associated with to the youth when we were educating them on why we need to make sure that our drinking water is safe and our air, not just outside, inside. 
And even when COVID hit, a lot of people didn't even realize the indoor air could be contaminated, as well as the overgrown vegetation, sewage gas, um, abandoned cars, uh, tires, uh, appliances. You know, those solid waste and vermin and everything make houses there. And so it was so much to be done that it was just, it was devastating. And these are the things that was on my mind. I grew up as an environmentalist, but I didn't know I was one. And I didn't like it. I didn't like planting trees. I didn't like planting flowers. But when I moved away and came back, I could see the importance of making sure that your environment and your immediate surroundings is always clean and is always safe. Next slide, please. So this is what we was trying to address. Exploitation, funding is redirected. Degen de degradation, it makes you feel like, you know, we're not like this. We're clean and we're decent. And if you would give us a, a half of a chance, we can show you what we're, what we can do. But the community was, it was, it was, it was just prevalent on site. The respiratory inf uh, infection rates, is, you know, they're higher than any other communities in the county. Cancer, diabetes, asthma, ADHD, high levels of sewer, sewage gas early in the morning during the summer because there's not a lot of water being used when people are at work or they're at school. And so the, the water lines drain. And if there is any sewage raw material left, then that sends up sewage gas through your drains in your bathroom and in your kitchen. And then you have that overgrown vegetation that was causing the asthma and allergy triggers and, and also bees. Next slide. And this was an opportunity to start over. We received that environmental justice small grant from EPA for $25,000 to address those issues. And the purpose was identified through community assessment research and data of the multiple impacts of various pollutants and health issues within the community. Next slide. And as you can see, our goal was to empower the community, the people, help them understand their health problems as it's related to all forms of their environment. And we need to develop more effective solutions through intervention and prevention. And prevention is my first go-to because we have no recourse after prevention. Uh, the outcomes was a 55, 59% increase in the awareness of environmental hazards within the community. And there was a 59 decrease in preventable illnesses because it's the small common sense things that we're overlooking when you're in a rat race, you got to work, pay the bills, worry about how you're gonna get things taken care of from one day to the next and you overlook the simple things that causing you to get sick over build up. Next slide. <laughs> Those are strategies. The first was a community meeting regarding the EPA grant. And we informed them that the jobs is, you know, via our newsletter and the park interviews, you know, children came from everywhere. And it, it hurt our heart because we couldn't interview them because they didn't live here. And some of the parents couldn't understand that. You should have seen the rage that some of them took on. And so the president was telling me, we need more money, Vanessa. I said, well, yes, but this is all we got right now. And we got to focus on us because some of these communities, these people are coming from, they're very nice parts. There's nothing here. And so we employed the three juniors, I'm sorry, and two seniors. And we divide the community in sections. Everybody know where they live and they're very familiar with the people in their surroundings. They deliver flyers, they deliver surveys, door to door, every house get a newsletter. We develop that home assessment tool from this survey and 114 households completed those assessment questions quickly until I had to lay the youth off. They had a whole nother month and they, the people were so excited to get something done in their hands and, and have a say. When you think they don't care, they really do care. And so I had to contact EPA and request 
the transfer of the youth final funds of their pay to the contractor's budget. And that was the guys in the community that was taking down there, eradicating this tall, overgrown vegetation, which helped the sight and viewing of the community. It actually enhanced it a lot better. Next slide, please. Now, this is just surveys of uh, results of, from the assessment of what I wanted to show. I'm not gonna go over all of this. I just wanna run through quickly. When you're educating people and you're giving them information and you're tallying up the data, you have to see what they know and what they don't know. Now, at the top, it says 80 households don't drink their tap water. 26 said they drink their tap water. But 97 said they cook with their tap water. If you don't drink your tap water and you buy a bottle of water, if you cook with your tap water, you're drinking and eating from the tap water. Those are the things that people in the community and all rural communities forget to think about because of the daily stressors. You have to cook in your bottled water as well and conditions improve just by making those simple little changes. Um, next slide, please. That was the most alarming result of everything that came out of that at home door-to-door -door assessment. These are white clothes, stains in the laundry and connected to the city sewers. There was no four that was not connected and we did not know that. There were the entry of the community, they still had um, what they call, um, I forgot what they were, uh, but they're right outside the door. You have to come in and they have to pump them there so often when they fill up. But this new mayor had that change. We had a new lift station placed down on that end where they are, and so they are now connected to the city sewer. Next slide. Now, rainwater. Are you concerned with the rainwater? We, we do have low elevations here. So we have sandy loam soil. Uh, it does soak in the ground very quickly and it dries, but with the high water table, you can be maybe a half a feet and there's water there. So these are some of the complaints that they had regarding stagnant water and streets. Next slide. It's a repeat. Okay, next slide. And then assess the safety of the home. You know, that's a critical health issue and especially in the particular environment that you live in. And these were some of the issues that we asked them regarding their homes. What do you have and what you don't have? And so these were some of the issues that they came up with, especially the no evacuation plan. You know, do know that, that we sit on the new manager's fault. And they keep forecasting there would be another um, large magnitude earthquake. But we have to understand that this is sandy loom soil. So when water mixed with sand, it becomes quicksand. And that's what happened to the old new magnitude. It, the whole thing just sank to the bottom of the river. And so we hope that that type of magnitude doesn't come back. But so far, so good. But we do have to have an evacuation plan as well as sending contact numbers to your family members, to other people outside of this area that can check on you. Next slide, please. Emergency disaster contacts. I just mentioned that personnel, all of those things are of critical need. Next slide. A solid waste. That was a targeted area in the community. Actually, um, my mom built a house on a side street coming into the community and we're the only house on that street. And so when everybody had moved away that actually lived here, my sister had rented the house out. People started using the other end of the street as a lover's lane. And when I came home, being an environmentalist, I had to pay the burden and you find out who's in your community in the, under the cloak of darkness while you're asleep. So we had to get that straightened out pretty quick. And I was really upset about it and we jumped right onto that. So that's not a good thing, not on my street, You're not gonna be down here doing that. So when they heard that a Frazier had moved back home, they skedaddled to another community. But these are the things that we found 
on the other end of the street. Just they, they drive for miles away to come to Howardville and dump anything that they have. Next slide, please. Um, 95 had no other concerns, 19 did. And of the 19, there were multiple comments, but these were the mess. Police harassment, need our own police, need safer environment for children, drugs in the low income apartments, recreation for children and fix the park, more businesses, gas station, fix streets and drainage system. The biggest need was a mayor to fix Howard did. Now the mayor, my husband, Jesse, he took this paper and went door to door and asked everyone about, did you say these things? And they all said they did. And they said, well, if I can try and fix a lot of it, would you at least, you know, give me a chance? And so they elected him. And that's the first thing he did. He got a police. We fixed the streets, got the sewer system upgraded. And so the citizens had to look into this and see what can we do? Everybody have to do something, not just the city council. Well, they need a safer environment for children. That's what those park ties was that you saw. You were right off the street, right into the park. There were no barriers other than the cross ties. So we kind of staggered it. The drugs in the low community, the police took care of that. Recreation for children and fixed the park. That's why that's one of our ongoing projects. We haven't gotten to the more businesses and gas stations, but this is where it started. And when you try to do what the citizen acts, things get better. Next slide, please. And the lessons learned was safe drinking water and clean air. Everybody wants it. It's a critical need. Law enforcement with the illegal dumping and harassment. Self-motivated to clean up lots. Every citizen spoke on that. Yet they are without proper equipment. And they truly care about the health, safety, and well-being of themselves and their children. And everybody wants to live clean and decent. And next slide, please. So that's where we came from to see if it was a can-do project. We can do it. As citizens, we can do this. And we entered that project into the Missouri Community Betterment Competition. And our youth won first place for addressing toxic environmental issues. So we're proud of that. And we still have the plaque. It's the shape of Missouri. Um, this is our community betterment committee. We have seven committees. Um, we have senior, youth, education, newsletter, and our environmental training is on board, but it falls on the education. And we have the CART and the Harville School Restoration Committee. We only started out with one, with three, senior, health, and youth. That's what we started out on in education. The newsletter, we couldn't get the information out fast enough, so that's how we got it done. The Harville School Restoration Committee is comprised of students who went to that school and graduated from that school. They live all over this country, so they have their own checking account under the Harville Community Bedroom, of course, and the park, it has its own checking account. Next slide. And our board of directors are our seniors who have retired in their own profession. This is just a picture of the city hall um, you can see the streets there, how they cracked and crumbled. But next slide. This was another part I took out of a rural project marketplace. And this in aerial view, there's a mayor up in this corner here. And this is a rural uh, area view of our community. The school is right here. This is Highway 61. We're less than a mile from the interstate. This is Interstate 55. And there's a school. This is the elementary school. This presentation here is a part of our community vision in the charrettes that we did. These ladies here was a part of making me cry because the, uh, the photo language. I told them I didn't want to go in that school. I just, I don't want to go in there. It's just destroyed. It's going to make me cry. They took a lot, over a hundred pictures and came out. And this is Catherine. She tried it on me without my knowledge. She said, well, Vanessa, what do you think of this? And it was a picture of the gym and the floorboards were, were just, raised up and oh, they, I, I cried right there in front of them because that I was a cheerleader and everybody loved that gym. Next slide, please. So I knew then the photo language was going to be a success when they had it in the park and it was. There's other information about the school when it was erected in 58. Um, it housed, educated, and graduated all Black students from 1959 to 1968 for 10 years. 
It was an act that flew in the face of a Supreme Court decision to deseg in 1954. So it went on the historic register with special significance. Uh, next slide. And these are the conditions of the school to your right. Doing the photo language outside, they picked the picture that reminded them of something near and dear to their heart and they wrote the information on it and it's left with us. This is the cafeteria. This is the high school. They came in and just demolished and everything that they could take out of it. This is the elementary school. It was still used for um, Head Start. And that's an outside picture. And that aerial vision of the uh, picture of the school is the high school. This is the gym. This is the shop. This is where our environmental job training class is going to be. That's the practical part. This is the classroom. And that's the music room where our museum is going to be. And all of this is the elementary part. But it now sits on 8.2 acres, but it was on 16 acres. And this is the housing subdivision that I mentioned. You can just walk right out the back door into the school. Next slide, please. And this was the exercise that I showed you guys earlier, but this is the gym floor. She popped that picture in my face and I just cried right there. This is the music room. How the conditions of it, the pictures that they took. There's an opening here. This part it fell in and vegetation has started to grow. This is a three tier uh, floor in the music. You can see how the great job they did when they cleaned it up. The outside photo language was for the classmates that grew in this community and graduated from the school. They picked, they chose these pictures and, and you had to read out, you had to report out why you selected those pictures. Next slide. And then again, there is pictures of the readout. This here is the photo language exercise for the restoration committee. They come home on the holiday and so we can get these things done during those holidays. Some of the pictures that they chose like this one was something they hope could be designed in the library. Next slide. Okay, we covered that. Next slide. Well, wait a minute. You can get to see the senior. This is the senior group. <laughs> this is the senior group. These were the youth and then the teenagers. And that's Annette, as I mentioned, the president. She and I were at a different table. It just wasn't enough room to put us all in there. But everybody has their own ideas. They have their own needs and their own wants. Give them the pen and let them write it down. And let's see. You can see through your environmental lens what the focus is. And that's what generated the more than top 10 choices. Next slide. That's our roundup. Next slide, please. That's our tie roundup. It's on the, the Harville School. That's my wonderful friend, Sam. He bought me this stick because he knew I'm scared of snakes and I had to use that to prod through the tall grass to make sure nothing is scrambling up. And so, he bought that he's from the Lake of Ozarks. I am the association coordinator for the stream teams in Southeast Missouri. It's comprised of 28 counties. So when we wanted to decide to do, our stream team decided to do this tower roundup to get specific information for that school from the county residents, I called them in and they came from all over the state. And those are some of the ones you saw in the different color t-shirts on purpose to assist us here. So uh, I didn't get that dirty, but I don't mind hugging my dirty comrades because they, they worked hard. Next slide, please. And that was our Jumpstar string team, our number 16, 17. There are over 5,000 string teams numbered in the state of Missouri since we came on. And so that was the five o'clock shadow. It was a wrap. We filled four trailers of tires, 53 footers, from all over this county and they was excited to bring them in. Next slide, please. And that's my crew. And those are the tractor tires. Next slide, please. Some of which you've already seen. This is where they were placed. Uh, oh, that's kind of cool. So I, the, I, I'm just not waking up. I can't believe it. I'm sorry, somebody. Hello? Princess, somebody is... Okay. 
Okay. This is our annual pink walk for cancer. And we have started to address all cancers, not just breast cancer, is, is, is debilitating. And so we circle around and have everybody to mention the lost one, the loved one that is gone. And we do purple for those that are still fighting. The pink, of course, is for the survivors. And we do silver balloons for those who have passed on from any form of cancer. And I step way back to take this picture because of the basketball court is where we, we're standing on. So take that, uh, remember that. Next slide, please. And we do presentation as well. So while the chairs are there, we have awesome presentation when we do our annual pink walk for cancer. So you see the tires, the youth spray those, and we try to capture pictures of everything that's done because sometimes I still have the child in me. And, and I want a can of spray so I can do some work. You know, you got to get out there and get with them. Uh, we had one six-year-old that was screaming. And we all looked around and one of the teenagers had taken the can of spray from him and we had to go find out what's wrong and he was bawling. So we had to take the can back, put it in his hand and show him how to move back and forth. The children love it. You give them something to do. And so I asked you guys to remember that, that because our good New Madrid County Road crew that helped us with the tires when they get extra asphalt. And they promised us that, and they did. And they come right back and they resurfaced that basketball court as well as the parking area. Next slide. And they was preparing to resurface the, the basketball court. Next slide. And this is where they got started. And next slide. This gentleman right here is the one who initiated that. He has since retired. Next slide, please. And this is just a snapshot of everything that took place. And remember, I told you that gravel that was there after they resurfaced the basketball court, they had enough to resurface this, cover that gravel dust and everything else and it took it straight to the street. So we was proud of that effort. And it was all total for in-kind materials and the equipment donations of those big machines. It's a $36,000 project and nobody dropped a dime. It's your work ethic, it's your volunteering. It's seeing, seeing you wanna do different things and people will come to help. And so nobody paid anything for any of these projects from the tires all the way to the basketball court. Next slide, please. And this is my ATSDR. Right after we finished the park, I received the letter because a lot of people all across the country knew that we had gotten an EPA cleanup grant right? and gave us an opportunity to be a community partner. And so, of course, we jumped yeah. on to that. We wanted to be a community partner. This is a part of the picture that I just think where I guess I was selected by somebody as ATSDR as a community champion. And so these five steps is what we actually did, but not knowing that we had did that. But we had to keep it moving because it is a step-by-step -step process, but you can't do it alone. Nobody can do it alone. You got to have partners. Next slide. And that's a presentation that I presented. I think Laura was here. There's another different color string team t-shirt. Uh, yes, Laura was here and took that picture. Next slide, please. And this is when the school was listed to the National Historic Register. Laura and I did a three-year stint with the Robert Wood Johnson uh, Foundation, and we were cohort one, the very first one, first 40 in the nation. And as we got ready to leave toward the end of our third year, um, they gave us $35,000 stipend if you will to do a project and once you get something in your heart that you want to get done any dime or nickel that you get you're going to put it toward that because you want to see the fruition and we didn't know that when we got listed to the historic register they don't pay for your sign you have to purchase that yourself and so that sign cost six thousand and fifty dollars and some of the materials that we purchased the 
we put on the school. Displays matter. That was the theme for National Historic Trust. Of, and every community is encouraged that has a historic building is to play along. And so displays matter and it still matters. So that was something we had to get that sign erected and that brought joy to our heart. Next slide. The theme this year for 2023 is people saving places. And you have to understand when you're doing that type of work of what he's doing, you have to know what you're doing and you have to know what's there and how to properly deal with it. And next slide, please. And this was our second year, I believe, of This Place Matters. And um, I had a pleasant surprise. Laura came down, she called, and she said, Vanessa, we have an 11th partner, a community partner, really. She said, and guess what? It's from Romaine. Romaine? The country? She said, yeah, it's <laughs> international. He comes to the state. He comes to visit. And I showed him, talked to him about the 10 communities and guess where he wanted to visit? And he wanted to come here. And that's him right there. And I said, well, I'm having a family gathering in my yard, we're eating and it's Memorial Day weekend. And so he can just come dive right in. And he did, he enjoyed himself. So we made a trip out to the school with those signs to take pictures because National Trust do want us to take pictures in front of the building and send them in. Next slide, please. And that was my training, National Peak. I went from there to them. Now, this me in the back, the tall person in the, what we call street language moon soup. <laughs> he loved it there. Yes, he did. I wish for him to come back, Laura. Thank you. But um, we had to go out in, in, this, in this tall grass back there and those white bats that was chemicals. And we had to find out what it was and the drums as well. And so if you're claustrophobic and don't know it, don't put that suit on. <laughs> you have to train your mind. You have to train your mind in, in order to do that. And so in my first experience, I said, oh, this is, I got this. And when I put it on and got zipped up and I was like, oh my God. So I got to, you know, focus. You have to focus to keep from wilding out. But that was an awesome experience. That's just part of what I did when I, we, I'm not sure where we were when we did that. We National Peak take you so many places. Next slide, please. This was our first job training class. We was getting them ready to remediate the school of asbestos and lead-based paint. When you get into the environmental field of working with this, that you have to be certified. If you don't have your credentials, they don't have to promote the local source hiring. And so we had to start a job training class and that's how we found National Peak. There are eight veterans in this class, and there were, I think, four fellas in this class, and a couple of them, I think, had did some time in prison. But this was so good about environmental justice and environmental work, period. You give them a second chance. And if it's, some, it's so many different professions that you can take on working with the environment, things that you love and know some of them like I tell them I talk to them just straight up they like the everyday language y'all love to come to Harville and just ride 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 some of y'all need to be transporting hazardous waste and they crack up you know you love to ride make money doing it next slide please <laughs> so we run the national peak curriculum we have 23 um chapters and this is their practical and the EPA would like for you to get them acclimated. If they can have their job training on the site, that is to be clean. They can be acclimated to the site and they won't be so fearful when they walk in. They've been there every day. So that turned out to be a win-win also. Next slide, please. That's the decontamination process. And of course, you have to put it in the newspaper. You want people to know what you're doing. I can tell you guys what we're doing, but are you going to believe me? So there's the proof of what we're doing, and it was a success. We had four additional job training classes just for that particular event to clean out the school because people, as you know, they didn't believe it was going to happen. But when those guys start bringing home $1,200 a week, everybody got mad and stormed the city hall and went for the job, but they couldn't because they weren't trained. They couldn't speak the language. 
And we had, I had been notified by OSHA that they were notified that our site was live and to expect the visit. And the fines had went up. And so when I told the city what they was facing, putting unqualified people on that job site, they told them, y'all need to get to class. We're not paying that. And next slide, please. It was an awesome, awesome time for them. And we and some of those guys got jobs before they could even get in the, the, the um in the school. And they got they made good money. And one of them went to uh Kentucky. They hired him right away. Most of the guys were military. This young man is military. And this young man is a veteran. Department of Natural Resources was a partner with us with this job training class. And he gave, they did their asbestos awareness, but I did it when I went to National P for my own training. I did it the next time. But they still come with the drinking water. And they gave me five certificates and said, Vanessa, give these to your top two students. And that was this one and this one. And they went to the uh, safe drinking water class that DNR had, and they were amazed that this one is a mathematician. This is uncle. He's a mathematician also. He had to end up helping the teacher teach the class because when people go to water uh, class, they they can do the answer the questions, but the math is hard. It's extremely hard. It was 22 of them in that class, but he helped them get their math down so that they could pass that test because there are a lot of great big needs in these communities for drinking water operators as wastewater operators. And some of these communities are being sanctioned because of that. And that's what has thrown the people into buying their drinking water. And I actually asked them to cook in your drinking water that you purchased. Next slide, please. That was a graduation though. And this brought me to our current grant that um, we were awarded by EPA, $600,000 assessment. And it covers the four communities, two in New Madrid County, Howardville, North Liberty, and two in Periscott County, Hayta Heights and Homestown. These North Lilburn in New Madrid County and Homestown in Pemiscott County was one of two of the communities that the federal government built after the sharecroppers protest on 61 Highway. As I mentioned earlier, Interstate 55 was not here. So the only way to travel north and south in this country was Highway 61. And the travelers saw the people camped out with the meager belongings of what they had, all they had left when they were cooked kicked out. It was 1,500 people stretched out through the boot hill, and they made the phone calls. And President Roosevelt had to get the people together and come down here and, and build these houses for them. So the, all of that information, the 1939 sharecroppers uh, protest, you can look that up, um, is, is a lot of information and is also in his library and library of Congress. So we are going to work with Hayti Heights and Howardville become on their own, just the efforts of one single man in each community. And we're trying to do everything we can to rebuild. And they're going to, they're going to model that project of what I just showed you. They're in that course now. That's where we started with the assessments. They're going to learn the term. They're going to learn the phrase, the phases. They're going to be acclimated to the contractors. They're going to ask questions and get answers. And they're going to be able to take on their own environmental challenges in their community. And they're going to speak to it so that people will know that they're on top of their game. And that's what our work is we're currently doing right now. We have down, we have 12 uh, projects on different properties throughout these four communities. And seven of them are priority. The school is priority. Um, hometown has a community that uh, community building is historic. Uh, it was listed on the National Register. They're getting a new one designed. Um, Hayti Heights has received several grants for their drinking water, and they got to get, they, they want to upgrade their water treatment plant. So there are a lot of environmental issues in rural communities that didn't used to be. And so now we're dealing with what people have to deal with in metropolitan areas. But by we're being out in rural areas, it's open space, we can see our environmental lens scans everything, and we can go right to the issues. So we're just transforming our community and we're going to redesign it with help in mind. And that comes from all of the work that we've done and all of my training. And 
Desmond, I'm done. Okay. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you very much. Very good. I, I think I'm going to call you Howard Ville's Woman of Action. <laughs> it's not me. I just generate interest. They think you generate you passion, on. you generate interest, you mobilize people. This is like the pinnacle of community mobilization and act, you know, activism. Yeah, this is a per you are a perfect example, and your community is a perfect example of like community agency, the community itself realizing what their needs are and then going after solutions. And you the you the woman of action. I'm sorry. Woman <laughs> of action. I think I was my path to the education took different turns that I didn't foresee. And so I, I had to go this way and that way, but looking back, everything that I had to do to pick my way to, I needed to regenerate and revitalize the community. Um, I worked in a law firm, so I've had to use, put my legal hat on and put that pen on this paper to some people, that's not right. I worked in the, the law firm I worked in was full of service uh, in Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, at that time, it was 175,000 people. I did everything except for traffic and criminal. I don't <laughs> like those two. And so uh, I I had to come back home after six years. I was forced because my sister really that family house and they was tearing it apart. And I had didn't have to pull the straw. My mom asked me, told me on her dying bed to take care of the house. So mm -hmm. when I was in my peak of, of of moving around, I worked in a law firm. I I uh, was the producer of this lawyer had his own uh, television show, 30 Minutes, uh, BT, every Thursday, and he had an hour gospel show on the radio. And he let me carry that show. I produced both of those. And all of a sudden, <laughs> the bad news came. Well, Lord, I guess you done gave me everything I need to equip me with, and I had to come home in tears. And that's what I saw when I got here. Lord have mercy, I got to deal with this. And everybody else is living large and enjoying their money in and, and large cities. And I'm here having to struggle with this, but I had to swallow my own pride. I didn't get to enjoy being on TV and radio. So, you know, hey, I can always go back to that. But right now, our community needs me. And yeah. so I had three or four friends and we sat down and look, I'm going to get these community betterment organized. We're going to get a charter. With the state, we're going to get a 501c3. That legal sense that I use is what kicked in mm -hmm. that enabled me to get this done. Mm -hmm. And I, I needed that. At the time, I didn't see it. But when we look at the picture as a whole, everything that we have tried to do, it worked. Not right now. Mm -hmm. There are so many other arms to what we have to do in any community, in any city, that Okay, we stalling right now. You want to hold the money up. You want to hold up the project. We're going to turn our attention to this. Mm -hmm. And that park, we go back to work on the park while the school sits there. And then we find other things to do while it's going on. So you still go back to that. You can always get it done. And mm -hmm. I, I was just grateful for the opportunity to help get those things going in the community. And now I'm, I think I'm getting close to going on, on a, a hiatus somewhere. I don't know where. <laughs> yeah, but I probably know. You deserve one. You deserve I'll be one. looking around. I'll so, be looking with my environmental lens to do something. <laughs> do okay. something there. Sonia, Sonia, you have any questions and comments? Yes. First of all, Vanessa, thank you so much for your presentation. It was so refreshing to hear how you really got involved with the community members, got community members involved in supporting community veterans and how everyone's so passionate about working towards addressing the needs of the community. Um, even from Zoom, I can feel your infectious energy and passion for what you're doing. Um, I, it's so refreshing to see this and hear about all the amazing things you're doing. Um, I had a few questions, actually. Sure. Um, one of the things you mentioned, especially when you were starting off, is you have, have all these great ideas, but you were facing a lot of setbacks. For someone who's like starting off in their career, like what advice do you have about how to persevere through these setbacks and um, how to keep working to get the community involved 
to the extent that they're involved in your community. It really lets you know what you made, though. And I think God, God give us the opportunity to find out. He just give us the passion to keep moving. As I mentioned earlier, nobody, everybody's not going to like you. But I was gone. I moved away. When I came back, there were a lot of people living here that didn't live here. So some of them knew of me, but they didn't know me. And so the two or three people that I did know that had the passion for it, we sat down. And then I told them, working in television, broadcasting, radio, you know you have to have the ears of the people. And the first thing is to be honest. Keep your word. Send those flyers out. Door to door, as I mentioned earlier, if the hellraiser don't show up, they didn't turn out the flyers because I don't like you. And I'm going to come in and I'm going to tell you all about it. I'm going to embarrass you in front of those federal pe people. But what they didn't know was the federal government was satisfied that you gave every door a flyer because sometimes you just get your own click. And your click agrees, but it's not always right. You need the voice and the consent of everybody that's in that picture, in that community. And when you get to the table, keep struggling. Well, you know what? If they're not going to show up, I'm going to start. And there's been a lot of times I went out to the park because I just love the park. I take my weed eater and I start weed eating. And then the kids come running because you know what they do? They pick up litter. We're a string team. And they know it's going to be some nourishments after everything is over because <laughs> I have their children in my control. And I'm not going to give them hot dogs. I'm going to give them good hot dogs, Johnson's. And sometimes they order pizza. But you know, as I told Laura when we come, when we meet, we eat. <laughs> if we don't eat, we don't meet. <laughs> and, and that's that. I put that's it in the chat. I know my role. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to eat the honey cake. But you have to love people. And Sonia, I know. You love people. You have to love people. And there are people that are not going to like you. We're not elusive to that. But when you run across somebody that has this attitude, they give you that look, okay, now your environmental lens is working. You can pick that up. Give them their <laughs> space. Just give them their space and keep your passion because somebody else like Laura is going to be there. She's going to cheer you up and you're going to forget about that person. Yeah. So as you keep going back, they're going to notice that way. Hey, She's not even affected by me. I'm this, I'm Mr. PhD and I'm so-and-so, so-and-so. But before you leave, you guys become best friends. And you know why? Because that person is just like you. Mm -hmm. That's why you don't really like people. But the environment is here for all of us. And there is something for all of us to do. And, and your job is connected to the environment. But people don't know that. But mm -hmm. COVID taught them. The environment run things. It can be used to hit, hurt you or it can be used to help you. And so it shut the world down. So who has the most important job in the country? It's not oil. It's not gas. It's not even education. It's the environment. And that's what we have to take care of. So we, as we say, cheer. We out cheer. If mm -hmm. we're going to run this culture health across this nation, isn't that right, Law? So I've been working in my community and my region, and I'm, I'm going to Flint. I'm going to Flint. I, I went to my national peak. Uh, refreshers and conferences and they just keep me rolling. I went to Portland, Maine. I come back from Portland, Maine uh, just recently and before that I was in Fort Pierce, Florida. So mm -hmm. they take all over the country. But mm -hmm. you have to have a for people and the work. Yes, yes. And do, we have, do we have other questions? We could circle back to you, Sonia, but let's see if other people oh, yeah, have course. questions. Anybody else has questions? Pat, Gloria. Yeah, I just have a quick, quick comment. Yes. We were hoping uh, we had a blizzard when we were in Benton Harbor. Um, Princella, Mary Alice, uh, Delia, three community nonprofits hosted an environmental health and memory use training. And Vanessa was going to come in as part of the training, but because of the weather and the death in her traveling partner's family, wasn't able to make it. But, um, and Mary Alice can't get into these Zoom sessions. I just wanted to bring that up. I think for me, I have to sign into Zoom before I can get in and maybe that's not working for her. I have to sign in a school account. So um, just wanted to put that out there. Vanessa, always a pleasure. <laughs> okay. Your, your brother-in-law's on the other side of the wall here trying to do the taxes or he would po poke his head in. <laughs> so, <laughs> Jesse, say hello to Vanessa. I will, I will. Okay. 
uh, other comments, questions? Sonia, you could go ahead. I'm, uh -huh. yeah, I'm just so impressed that a community member just got there and, you know, organized and got people together. And it's something that I wish could be seen in so many other communities because you can't always wait for the government, quote unquote, to spearhead things. And, you know, but if you get started, then, and especially having a resource person as she was to know how to get to these funding and organizations. And then together, I like that, together the community did something, including the children. Mm. And uh, as she said, don't, don't get discouraged about the ones who are naysayers. Just get started and very often they become your very good support. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you. They'll come running when they see they try to discourage the guys. It's not going to happen. They just laying around. It's not going to happen. You're doing it for nothing. But when it happens, they beat the city hall doors down. They want money too, but you just want a handout. It doesn't work like that. But, you know, the library that I had to use when I worked in a law firm, it was a huge room as big as some houses with the ladders that zoomed down one wall to the other. And when I moved back home, forced to come back home, the statues pertaining to the whole county went before pays. I was oh my God, I got this. And so we just shot out doing whatever things that we need to do, but people have to have somebody that know when you live in a rural community and your education is not expanded, you just comfortable with what's what, what is what is as long as you can make a living, but to spearhead a project, you got to know what you can do. And let's see, can we do this? Look at this paper. This is what you all said. It's not what I said. The yeah. students went out and gathered this information. So once they did it, we put it together and this is what you guys said. What can we do on here for ourselves? And that's what the park was. And mm -hmm. then the mayor got elected and he took care of the rest and everything else on there that they wanted could only be done in the school. So we still have just those two projects, the school and the park, and we're still upgrading. And we're, we're right now currently doing the assessments, but see, we was gonna to move to the redevelopment phase for the school. But in the, our original cleanup grant, we had written that this is gonna be a model project for the Boot Hill because it's the first big cleanup grant that had ever come to the Boot Hill. And so COVID, and all the other barriers and delays that had taken place, time had been far spent. And so we, my heart wouldn't let me try to do that. There still was some asbestos left anyway. So, you know, it's time for them to come aboard. They're supposed to model, they need to get started now. So the grant was written to bring in those communities for to start the process of assessing their community. And we're starting from the ground up and mm -hmm. the water that's in between and the air. That's a part of what makes the world go round. And so that's what we're doing. And they're supposed to be on this on this uh, webinar. I'm thinking they may have problems because I don't see anyone on here. Uh, that's who's been calling my phone also. Okay. Now, especially like how you, you train those guys and empower them to, you know, to get better jobs and to be able to be flexible. I love that. Those guys oh, who are certified. You. As I mentioned, they eight of them were veterans. So although they're young, they, they just only needed retooling. They had did most of it. And some of them had worked in Indiana uh, remediating asbestos. So they became reacclimated and familiar with the things that we were talking about. They enjoyed it. And you have to make it fun. And you know, the EPA grant money couldn't be used for food. So the community veteran donated coffee and cookies in the morning for for breakfast because you know you as they say you're not happy when you're hungry and you know you have attitude but it looked like they was getting up just to get that coffee and donuts so <laughs> that was something that helped them bond they not only bonded and they were able to speak their peace and you know just like when you have a group of people in the room and you give me your ideas and I want everybody to give me an idea you're not leaving here until you give me an idea what we're gonna do. And so when you write down everything they say, you come back to the meeting and see what you said on paper, they listen. 
You don't see that in rural communities. You may come and visit and we tell you these things, but that's not what on paper when you come back. So you're running your own show and you'll come back, but we won't be there. But when people see that, you know, Laura uh, paid so much attention to me that I didn't know. And when I knew the thing she wanted me to, Vanessa, they're updating the community book. Uh, 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 we want you to do the community part. What? what? They doing it now? And so I said, well, I love to do the community part, but I have to make sure that it's put in plain spoken language so the citizens can pick this up and run it. It's not about that, as my grandmother would say, highfalutin educated people. It's not about that. <laughs> the one that gets the work done is the ones that love it. And there's another thing that you may pick up. It's the hard work. The heart. The heart. There's a dual meaning. It's the hard work. And only people that have passion can do that. They run into roadblocks on you. But I'm not going to give up. You know what that roadblock is for? To sit back and say, well, hey, it's another way. I'll give you that one. But I'll be there. <laughs> Sonia, do you have a, another comment or question? Yeah, I do. Um, but before I ask my question, does anyone else have any questions? I just want to make sure everyone has the chance to ask any questions or any comments. Um, okay. okay, Laurel is, is leaving us. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Laurel. Good to see you. Okay. Good to see you. I have a three-hour class. <laughs> I'm going to okay. run. Bye. Okay. All the best. So let's do um, maybe about yeah. two more questions, and then we'll uh, wrap things up. Absolutely. Well, I can jump in with my, my question. Um, Vanessa, you sort of touched upon this as well during the Q&A, but um, I was wondering, other than taking a well-deserved break in vacation, um, how do you see this movement, like, continuing to grow in the next few years? What is your vision for this going forward? Because um, you've done so much amazing work right now. How are you going to keep the momentum going? I think being the cohort of Robert Wood Johnson, uh, the first cohort of the first 40 across the nation, that's our task. Actually, equity, diversity, and inclusion was coined by us. We set the definition for that. And you know, buzzwords pick up and take up all over the country. Everybody uses it. But when I look at grants or proposals and see equity by itself or diversity by itself, sometimes equity and diversity, but not inclusion. Inclusion is the driver. And I'll put it to you like this. Equity is being fair. Okay, that's all it is. Diversity, it's being multiracial. Okay, so we're at the table. Inclusion. You can come to the table, but we're not going to do a list thing you have to say. So you can come to the table, but you can't make them listen. Inclusion means listen. And so that is the task that we have been set to build the cultural health across this nation so that everybody may learn. Robert Johnson money is not easy to get. Those people in that building have passion. They can pick up your paper and read it. And when they read and get so far, there's no passion in this. It's going in the trash. So I'm set. I got to get my community going and work with other ones at the same time. It's not all about us. But hopefully once we get acclimated and get everything that we need to move on, I can keep moving across the nation, helping other rural communities and even cities. I've been pulled into cities for the Carter Carburetor plant in uh, St. Louis that had TCE in it and it was covered three blocks. The children in St. Louis have the highest heart transplant rate in the nation and they was able to get funding to get the building tear down. I did the research and the community need for that grant and that's what they used to get funding. So I hit and miss. But Sonia, I intend to keep going. <laughs> I just love what I do and I love people and babies. I love the babies too. All right. I'm so glad to hear that. We definitely need more people like you leading the charge. I think we all are here. We need each other. I need y'all to help me. That's where <laughs> I get my stuff from, you all. Just to know what you guys are doing. And, it, and that helps me to say, hey, keep going. 
So we encourage one another. Thank you. That's right. That's right. I think the energy and the concert, what has gone into this has been absolutely incredible and such a good example. Thank you so much. Wow. <laughs> this yeah. has been an eye opener. Right. Thank you again. So You're Patricia, welcome, Patricia. <laughs> Patricia is calling in from Trinidad, the island. So there is a place that you could go. Oh my God, invite me out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It has us it we need we need that sort of enthusiasm and kind of energy to get things done. I think sometimes we take too laid back a an approach, but um, this is why it is been this has been absolutely fantastic. Oh, Thank you. <laughs> you have to, you have to just take things as they are and and not expect the most out of everyone. You people coming into evening meetings, they're hungry. You know, I don't want to hear how long is this gonna take? I gotta go cook. My kids are at home, you know, have some crackers or juice or a little slice of tea or anything. And, and they can feel a little better and we can move right quickly and get through the meeting. So the next time they know it's gonna be nourishment. So they're gonna run right on in and we do Saturday meetings so they can get in and get out. But the most important thing about doing anything is to see the results, see it materialize in your face. You can do this. It wasn't just me, it was all of us. So those are the type of things that you have to look at when you go into a community of strangers. I don't know them, but I love them. Because I care about them. I don't want anything to happen to them. I love babies. Mm -hmm. I love seniors and the veterans. Now, if you want to get me angry, that's when you tar with them. And when these children are being slaughtered for no fault of their own, that's heartbreaking. And the councils in rural communities, they don't have that. Mm -hmm. You've got to tough it up and kick it up and, and move on. So we carry a lot of scars, but those scars have taught us to keep moving, stay focused, and use your scan in any and everything you do. Use your scan. You're going to find a problem, and you try to address it. And we have to work toward prevention because there is no response or recovery mm -hmm. if it's something that should happen. Mm -hmm. okay? Right. No, absolutely. Very good. Mm -hmm. Anything else, Sonia? Anything else? Maybe... Sonia, you have any any last words you want to say before we get off air? Um, yeah, I, I I just wanted to say thank you everyone for coming. Thank you so much, Vanessa, for being here. Um, this, like everyone has been mentioning, this has been an amazing experience. We learned so much about what you're doing. We're, we're inspired by your energy and optimism and everything that you put into it. And um we can't see where you just can't wait to see where you go with this. So thank you so much, Vanessa, and thank you everyone for coming today. Come to all of y'all's communities. I make I need to get me a sign with with that that neon sign and say Vanessa's in your community. I'm here for a meeting, and I will so travel with that. I got some news for you, Vanessa. Benton Harbor is inviting you to come. <laughs> we have an open invitation, Princella, Princella Tobias. She is another person that like is like you, <laughs> woman of action. So I'll connect you both. Oh my goodness. I'll connect you both. She has a newspaper. We'll so I think one of the things she could help with is like put your information in her newspaper and vice versa, you know, in your newsletter. So yeah. People want uh, you to be to be on vacation, but also come to places to help. So we'll work it all out. <laughs> well, you know, believe it or not, my vacation is going places to help people. That's what okay. brings me joy. Okay. Brings me joy. As I said, we have went and spent three or four days in different places, but I I didn't rest because I I wanted to be doing something. And, and that's where I get my health. I, I get my health is, is is awesome. And, you know, when I teach the kids that, you know, when we grew up, they didn't tell us that. Just do it. Just mm -hmm. do it. And so, you know, doing this 
is you are exercising your arms, your legs, your lungs, mm -hmm. you're breathing out in the open air. You're going to be healthy. And a lot of these guys have grown up and played basketball in school. And this year, our county school went to state and won first place. So we still wow. doing it. <laughs> That's good. Congratulations. Guys, that's spreading those tires and things. They grown up and they're doing it. We won first place in the state. That so is. they went to see the governor last week. So we know just those little bitty gems, you keep checking on them. They'll eventually grow and shine and blossom, but somebody has to be there to take care of them so That's that great. the next one growing up can see you need to maintain this. Yes, yes, yes. So thank you so very much. Thank you, uh, Sonia. Thank you, everyone who was on here today. And we hope each one of you have a great weekend and continue to be inspired by persons like our guest speaker today. Uh, next week and next month, we have, as we saw earlier, a number of other presentations. So hopefully you will tune in on Friday. If it's Friday, it's Environmental Fridays. Take care. Yeah, environment. <laughs> yeah. Don't forget, we got a song. When you hear the boot heel, you know who they're talking about, the Missouri boot heel. So we're in the news again, but it's not for good. So y'all pray for us. We will. We will. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.